from Workplay United States to talk about quantum feedback enhanced metrology. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? Great. Let me start off by thanking Professor Gadget for the kind introduction and also our session chair. But let me also uh, give a word of thanks to you and all the organizers on behalf of all of us for your over-the-top hospitality and organization in this conference. So we are very grateful to you for that. The subject of the discussion today, of course, is quantum mechanics. I wanted to broaden my talk a bit more once I got to see uh, the position in the speaking order. So I added a tagline, harnessing a new resource. This allowed me to not change my title, but in fact, have something a bit broader. As we heard in Professor Ganger's talk, we hear this term now quite often, quantum technology. And this to me is a very interesting term because, to be honest, it had different meanings over the decades. If you look at the timeline that started in 1905 with black body radiation and other things, and the seminal paper of Bohr in 1913 entitled On the Constitution of Atoms and Molecules, this is a very readable paper. In fact, on the third part of this paper, Bohr says, the physics of atoms is just different than the physics of other stuff, without explanation. It's just different. And I think this really is the tagline for quantum mechanics. It was very different. And in the beginning days, quantum technology was the quantum or quantized part of it. And only more recently do we have the more exotic things that came as excess baggage in the 20s and 30s turning into a technology. And that I think is tremendous in terms of a revolution. Words like coherence and superposition and entanglement are now a resource for technology. And this is really driving many things in the field, whether it's sensing, communication, or computation. But in all honesty, there's something even broader than that. And that, I think, is the new intellectual revolution of thought in quantum mechanics that's being fueled by this technology. There was a slide, your slide, Professor Genger, started like 1944, right, on the evolution of, of quantum thought. And what I want to actually share with you today is that there are new resources and ideas in the basic theory of quantum mechanics that are coming out. Because in reality, there are things that we could not do before. So we could never test them. We could never think about them. And that to me is something that runs as a fabric through all of these topics of superconductivity and magnetism and, and so on and so forth. And that really will be the subject of discussion today, <coughs> measurement. You see, coherence and entanglement, these are usually good words in quantum mechanics. Measurement is sometimes the bad word. This brings on classical physics. But it's a necessary evil, because somehow I'm not quantum mechanical. I am just here, not here and there. So at some point, I have to collapse this quantum mechanics into something which is classical. And moreover, if you were to build a quantum computer, this is the question I get all the time, when can you look at it, not during the computation? Because if you look at it during the computation, you spoil the entanglement. But in fact, what I want to talk about today is that measurement in this context is when it's done by an environment where you don't have control over it. When we become the environment, measurement takes on a whole different purpose. And in fact, there is a richness to that. It becomes a resource. And that's really the talk that I want to give today. <coughs> So let's start putting some concrete examples here. The invention of the laser is tremendous. What we see, of course, fueling this advance is the physics of atoms, and in particular, many identical atoms. If you were to calculate, let's say, here's a two-level atom with ground state, excited state, you can calculate in time-dependent perturbation theory what is the emission rate using quantum mechanics of this atom. If the atom is subject only to vacuum, then that's spontaneous emission. If you drive the atom, then of course you can have stimulated emission. And the stimulated emission rate gets faster, of course, if you populate the same state. Okay, that's there. 
if you take this idea and say, well, I don't want to simply drive this very simple transition, I want to make some more complicated state, then we can have the science of MRI. We can take an ensemble of spins and put them in some non-trivial state and watch the dynamics. In this particular case, we're looking at the dynamics of the hydrogen atom here in water. Okay. So MRI is really about quantum spin dynamics. So where does the environment come in in both of these things? Well, it comes in usually in a bad way for a laser. If you have defects, they're in fact measuring your atom and they change its frequency. And they don't tell you about what they're doing. They simply measure your atom. And when they do that, you lose coherence. In MRI, it's a little bit more positive depending on how healthy you are. But your tissue is measuring the spins. And you start to get a contrast between the lifetimes. But again, you have decoherence. This is this decoherence when there is an environment that you cannot access. I don't know what the tissue is measuring of my system. So in reality, decoherence results from a misplacement of quantum information. It's not as if you destroyed it. It's a resource, like entropy itself. You cannot destroy it, you can only lose it, forget where you put it. So in fact, when you have something like classical physics entering, it's simply because the entanglement is spread over things that you don't have control of. So can, the real question that I want to ask is, can we get out of this limit? Can we be in a limit where the quantum measurement process itself is an engineering resource rather than a suppressor of quantum behavior? Okay. So there's three parts to the talk. In the first part, I want to go beyond classical or canonical notions of measurement in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, when we read the textbook, it says you make a measurement and you collapse it into an eigen, you collapse the superposition state into an eigenstate. Okay. In the second part, I will show you examples of how we can look at new types of measurement to explore even the most fundamental of ideas, such as uncertainty. This is something Heisenberg talked about a long, long time ago. And in the third part, I would like to demonstrate that if you take some of these new concepts, we can actually put them to use to measure something which is not possible in the classical world. Those are the three parts of the talk for today. So I would like to thank, of course, members of my group who do all the hard work. And in particular, I want to acknowledge two folks that are not in this picture because they moved on. Shai Hakonen Gorgi, who is now a professor at the Technion and also Lee Martin, who's currently a postdoc at Harvard University. Shai is actually, I think, in the, in the audience today, toward the back. So the first part, beyond canonical notions of measurement in quantum mechanics. This is the usual situation we see in textbooks. Let's just imagine that we start off with a spin system as our very canonical quantum system. And in this particular case, the quantization axis is up and down in the plane of this board. So if you have a measurement meter, then there are only two possible things this meter can read. It will either read up or down. Okay, those are the two eigenstates of this measurement system. If we prepare a superposition, shown as this purple arrow, and you measure it, then half of the time your meter will read up, and half of the time your meter will read down. This is page 10 or 20 in some quantum mechanics textbook. So let me start to put some mathematics to this, because then I'm going to start to bend the mathematics of this. Professor Miller, you are an aficionado of mathematics because of familiar relations, so please permit me uh, the ability to write some equations. In quantum mechanics, everything happens because of an operator. No different here in the measurement setup. We define a set of operators shown by this capital pi, because in fact there are projectors. And these projectors are labeled by an index here, J, telling you the different possible measurement outcomes. So in the case of this spin a half measurement, there will be just the plus outcome and the minus outcome, showing you up and down. And these projectors, they act on a quantum state sign, right? And what they give you is, is this expression here. And in fact, the projector itself is this, pro this uh, combination of J both as the vector and its adjoint. So that's an operator here. Okay. 
This particular piece here is just an overlap or an inner product. It's a constant. And it tells you what's the overlap between your function psi and any one of those eigenstates j. So if we look at this for the two simple cases, if you had an eigenstate j, then this thing becomes one, and what this is doing is just projecting you onto that eigenstate. If you have the other eigenstate, since they are orthogonal, you get zero. And so this is the mathematics of projective measurement that's there. Embedded in this mathematics are the three cardinal rules, all three of which I will break in the next set of slides. The three cardinal rules are the measurement is projective, rather obvious, because I've written it as a projector. The measurement is irreversible. After you make a measurement, it goes in an eigenstate. That's the end of the story. Okay. And somehow, in the textbook, this measurement is also instantaneous. Poof. You collapse the wave function. And all three of these things we will relax and show you that, in general, measurement can be more complicated than any of these things. Let me go back to this example that I just started off with. This is the world of the laser and the atom. And what I want to show you is that in this case, even in this very simple case of one atom, the quantum mechanics of projectors is really inadequate to describe what happens in this physics. So you have now this very simple spontaneous emission. Here's an atom, and after you excite the atom, it releases a photon as it relaxes at some rate gamma. A very simple system. So now I can go ahead and measure this photon with a detector. And this is a very simple photo detector. It just says, click when I get a photon, and it doesn't do anything when I don't get a photon. So it's a detector that just goes click. So what happens when it, says, when it goes click? When it goes click, the detector confirms that your atom was initially in the excited state. Right? Because obviously it has to be in the excited state to decay. If it's in the ground state, nothing is going to happen. So this part seems like the usual quantum mechanics. There's a click, and you measure something. But the no click is actually even more interesting. You, one should not think that if your detector doesn't click, you have not made a measurement. That seems very strange. But the no-click is a perfectly good measurement. Because the no-click is telling you, after a long time, that you were not in the excited state. That's just as valid as the first one. But you see, it's very strange. Because no detection from a ground state or an undecayed excited state, that's also possible. Maybe you didn't wait long enough. Right? You were in the excited state, but it didn't decay yet. So you see, it's more complicated. Now we have a concept of time in measurement. And it's different for the two cases. For the first case, it's a rather quick jump. For the second case, it's a smooth evolution. So those projection operators, they don't work for this kind of setting. Okay. So I shown that equation to motivate that we need a new set of operators to look at measurement more generally. But it should have the similar structure, saying that if I want to look at the state at some later time, I should define some operator, which I now call capital omega, instead of pi. And for those that are in this field, those are called Krauss operators, which show you a generalized measurement. And you will have, again, these J outcomes, but they need not be orthogonal anymore. So in this case, it's not orthogonal. It's very different when you have something jumping versus something not jumping that are there. So you can write these operators for the click case and the no click case. For the click case, you see you have this interesting matrix element G and E, so you take an excited state and you turn it into a ground state. That's how you go from the excited state to the ground state. But it has a time dependence. If you wait longer and longer, if you are in the excited state, you will relax. Okay. And the no-click case has two terms. The first term tells you that if you are in the ground state, you stay there. And if you are in the excited state, you're probably going to relax after a period of time. So you can even write then, for a more general space, the full density matrix. And you start to see measurement is now becoming more complicated. You have elements that are decaying. You decay to the ground state here. But this coherence is also 
enter the picture and decay. So this was to motivate that we can write these operators for more realistic systems. This is the simplest of systems, just one atom. So this breaks a little bit of this uh, projective nature immediately. The measurement is not simply projective. What about instantaneous? What about this piece? Is this click really instantaneous? Or does it take some time? This was a debate for many decades in quantum mechanics. And I think it's pretty clear at this point that a click is just something that goes so fast that you were not able to resolve it. So if you were able to slow it down, would you see it? Yeah, you would. So let's do that. As an example of how you slow down the measurement. Any Scandinavian colleagues here? This is really a piece of calcium uh, crystal here. Right? It's called Iceland Spar. This is a very ancient Viking crystal that has birefringence in it. So what this calcite crystal does, that if you put in light, which is unpolarized, it's birefringent, so this polarization, which is horizontal, just goes through. The polarization, which is vertical, has a shift. So it has a different index of refraction, depending on the polarization. So you see double images if you take this crystal and look at it. Depending on the thickness of this crystal, I get a bigger shift or a smaller shift. So you can imagine making the crystal thinner and thinner and thinner. And what that will do is it will start to take the shift, which is shown as these two beams. I showed them here in the side view as two histograms. That's where you would measure the intensity on, on a screen. These two histograms start to come together when it's so thin. And in fact, if there was no thickness, they would be on top of each other. You couldn't tell the difference between the two polarizations. If you are in the limit that the two histograms overlap, this is called a weak measurement. You cannot tell the difference unambiguously between the two states. If you are in the limit when they are separated, then there's no problem. If you have any count here, it's in this state. And if you're in here, you have this state. So why would you ever want to make a measurement that does not tell you which state you're in? The utility of that measurement is that it does not collapse your wave function. This projective measurement immediately takes you to an eigenstate. This one doesn't. This one just gives you a small kick, partial collapse. You remember I showed you the picture of the spin pointing sideways? If you make a weak measurement, it just goes slightly up or slightly down. You have not collapsed the wave function yet. So this starts to become an interesting tool in our measurement saga. Okay. So in fact, if you start measuring this system in time, what happens? You go ahead and make a weak measurement, and another weak measurement, and another weak measurement. So you can make a record as an experimentalist. At time zero, I measure this value for r, which is the readout. A later time, I measure a different value, a different value, a different value, a different value. The measurement that you record as an experimentalist has some correlation with the state. For example, if it were in this histogram that you're more correlated to be here versus here, it also has some noise. We should start thinking about noise, quantum fluctuations, and so on and so forth. So I write this measurement signal as some kind of deterministic piece and a piece with noise. And if I add all of those contributions up, in fact, I can figure out how the density matrix evolves in time. Each one of these measurements kicks the state a little bit. And in fact, I can construct then a quantum trajectory. This is now an interesting object. This tells us the saga or the story of this quantum spin. Every little measurement kicks it a little bit. And that is the tra trajectory it traverses. The interesting piece is, you can't measure that trajectory directly. You can only predict it. Right? This weak measurement tells me something about the system. I then make a guess as to where it is. If I were to measure it with the projection sense, I would collapse the state. So you have another one of these interesting quantum resources. It's there, but you cannot measure it. So let me show you how we infer its existence and how we use it as a tool. So this is a uh, conference on superconductivity. I should mention something about superconductivity. So 
All of the devices that I show you that we work with in the lab are based on Joseph's injunctions. And in particular, the Joseph's injunction for us is a nonlinear inductor. And this nonlinear inductor, when coupled with the capacitor, makes a nonlinear oscillator. And this oscillator, if quantized, becomes a qubit. That's the story of all of these devices. So here, for example, is an LC circuit with the Joseph's injunction. We're looking at its two levels. And we put it in a resonant cavity. So if you put photons into this cavity, you will shift the frequency of the cavity depending on the junction state. It's just like putting a capacitor with a dielectric. Once you put the dielectric, you change the frequency of the circuit. In this case, your dielectric is polarizable. Spin up and spin down will give you different frequency shift. This is the physics of all qubits made with this kind of circuit. Okay. So what if I were to probe this with a very, very small number of photons? In particular, less than one photon on average. In that case, the two histograms corresponding to the qubit in state, or the spin in state up or state down, overlap in this weak measurement way. Okay? And this is real data, real parameters for what we see. They are overlapping. If you want to make a strong measurement, you want to get out of this regime. You see, the weak measurement just kicks the spin a little bit. It doesn't project the state. I have two options to get out of this mode to test quantum mechanics. I can just average longer, right? As the data comes in, the signal to noise gets better, as we all know, square root of n, square root of time. These histograms narrow, and in this particular case, you see the two histograms are separated. So if I just take a series of weak measurements and wait, they become a strong measurement. Or I can increase the number of photons in the cavity. That increases the separation of the two histograms. So these are the two things that atomic physicists, and also us, have available to us in this cavity QED physics. Okay, so this would make a strong measurement, so I can do both. So now I'm going to show you data that demonstrates this kind of weak measurement trajectory business. Okay? The first technological piece is that superconductivity is absolutely crucial to these experiments, because to measure one photon, I can't use a semiconductor amplifier. None of them have enough accuracy to do this. So we spent at least almost two decades and continued to build these amplifiers to measure things at the near quantum limit. So this is generation number 17 of this particular design. So that's crucial there. This is the experiment we want to do. Here's the chip. We put it in a superposition, like that orange, that purple spin I showed you. And canonical quantum mechanics tells you that after a measurement, you have spin up, spin down or spin up, I want to actually measure this individual traces. What is actually happening as I put forward the measurement process? Easiest way to show this is with a movie. Okay. So what's the measurement protocol? I prepare the superposition state shown here. This is purple. 50% up, 50% down. The same state that I showed you in the very first slide. Then I excite this cavity on resonance. So I'm going to measure sigma z in this particular case. I measure the z component with one photon on average. And then depending on the light which is transmitted through the cavity, I'm going to update my best guess as to where I think the state is in real time. And this produces one trajectory. Okay. And this is what this particular trajectory looks like. We have done something the founders of quantum mechanics perhaps didn't want us to do, which is to look inside this measurement process. That's one iteration of going from, in this particular case, a superposition state to an eigenstate. Physicists are all cynics, especially me. We start off by saying, well, how do you know that was the right trajectory? Because you told me you can't measure it. So who would know? How are you to check that, in fact, this trajectory is the proper state update that's there? So let me walk you through this procedure. How do you validate that trajectory? In this particular measurement, 
After all, what I'm doing is I'm making a prediction on where I think the vector is pointing. Right? I start off with here, I make some measurements, and my calculation says the vector points here. What can I do in that case? I can just go measure it. Right? There should be some statistics associated with that vector. If the vector was pointing horizontal, and I measure it, 50% of the time it should be down, 50% of the time it should go up. If it's an eigenstate, it should be 100% of the time up. So you see, I can actually go ahead and take many of these trajectories. At the end of each one of these trajectories, I make a strong measurement, and I calculate that ensemble. And I think this is actually the best thing with a picture. Okay. So I go ahead and evolve the system. I start with the same starting point. And I evolve to some final time here, shown by this dashed line. And at this dashed line, I make a strong measurement. Okay. And I'm going to look at all the trajectories that end up at the same point in T final. Right? I run the experiment. In each one of these four color trajectories, I predict the same vector. It should be at this vector, this vector, the same vector. So I can now look at the same final state here has this alpha and beta as my coefficients. That's where it's pointing. But now if I make a strong measurement, I can actually measure this alpha and beta and see, if, did I actually get the right state? That's what these dots are. Those dots show you point by point on that trajectory where I've done this procedure. And you can see the update agrees precisely with quantum measurement. So this trajectory indeed is the correct guess for where the quantum state is. The statistics of measurement tell you that. So now we have a resource. With this slide, we have a tool. We can go ahead and look at the dynamics of a quantum system. The measurement is driving it, but it doesn't feel bad feels useful because, you, in fact, you can figure out where the state is and then do something with it. What shall I do with this? Going to second part here. Can I measure something that's not so easy to measure or was not conceptualized? Another tenet of canonical quantum me mechanics, you cannot measure position and momentum with arbitrary precision. This is the statement of Heisenberg. The original statement was accompanied by this particular setup, which after some back and forth with Bohr, was revised a bit, but nonetheless is agreed upon now. You have an electron, and you would like to measure the position of this electron. So Heisenberg envisions irradiating it with gamma rays. Okay, so gamma rays of some very narrow wavelength, which should be good enough to image the electron. By the way, this is not possible, <laughs> even today. It's definitely a construction experiment. The Duncan experiment. So you excite this photon, but of course you see the momentum of the photon, you excite the electron, the momentum of the photon is transferred to the electron. Okay, so now the electron has a momentum, and you don't know exactly where this photon is scattered. It can be in some different directions. So you have a delta x on the screen. And the product of this delta x and delta p, we all know Heisenberg calculates to be h bar. This is not the only uncertainty relation that exists in quantum mechanics. In fact, this is the typical one you learn in the class. Right? This was actually penned by Robertson in 29. Okay, that's there. And in fact, Schrodinger himself wrote this one. It's even more complicated. So it's telling you that if you have the simple case of coherent states in a continuous phase space, that's the right one. If you have more complicated quantum states, you can see other uncertainties. And in fact, this is still 1930. This one was penned by McCone and Patty in 2014. So people still write uncertainty relations. This one, you see, called stronger uncertainty relations for all observables, incompatible observables. You will see immediately a difference. This one is the product of the uncertainties. This one is the sum. Okay. And the mechanism for this is that when you have a product, it's very easy to actually get a null result for that product to be zero especially if the commutator is not a constant. For a spin, the commutator of two spin directions is another spin. Yeah. So the question is, could you actually measure this? And in our experiment, can you measure x and p at the same time? With neat measurements, what would you get? That's the experiment to be done. Okay. The first thing in a few slides that I want to show you is how do you actually change the measurement axis? 
This took us many years to figure out. It's actually very complicated. But it comes from a technique of atomic physics. This is a technique called sideband cooling. Before, I was exciting the cavity on resonance. Now let me excite the cavity off resonance. So here's the frequency of the qubit, right? Uh, here, here's the frequency of the cavity. And what I can do is excite in blue. So in fact, I'm a little bit of short of energy to emit. So I take some energy from this qubit and then emit a photon. So this is called sideband cooling. So this is used in atomic physics or solid state physics all the time. And the Hamiltonian, or the term here, tells you that there is a creation and annihilation with A and A dagger okay, of the photon and sigma sigma dagger of the atomic state or qubit state. You can do the opposite. You can have too much energy. If you have too much energy, you deposit it into the qubit, so you heat it. Okay. So this has the opposite terms, A dagger, sigma dagger. Okay. Nothing special going on here. But then we did something absolutely crazy. What if you heat and cool at the same time? What, what happens then? In this case, you just add the two terms, and then you get something rather magical. You get a term that has A plus A dagger times this sigma X plus sigma Y. That's exactly the interaction of a dipole with a field. So in fact, you can put the same kind of dipole coupling that you have in cavity QED, but you can control the axis by choice of this phase delta between your side bands. So now, before I was measuring sigma z, now I can measure any axis on, in the xy plane. Okay, so this is a capability I didn't have before. I can change my measurement axis. Okay. This is what the actual chip looks like. It literally has a chip with multiple ports where I drive these side bands on one port to measure x, so to speak, or sigma x, and the other one to measure sigma y. So now I can measure these two incompatible components at the same time. What about the trajectory? The trajectory now is complicated. Because before it was very simple. You were getting some information, you were updating the state. Now you're measuring these things that are not compatible. What happens to the trajectory? And in fact, I won't have to use both of these pointers, right? So what's happening here, you measure in one direction here, the other direction here. How do you update the state that's there? But I showed you the mathematics for doing it. It's these cross operators. And you can nest them one at a time. The first measurement of x, then y, and so on and so forth. And in fact, you are then able to reconstruct these trajectories. Here is an example of measuring x and p, or sigma x and sigma y at the same time. And here is an example of trajectories where I measure the usual way. You see, these collapse to the two eigenstates of the system, as they should. You will notice something very interesting here. There is no collapse. So this collapse of the wave function is gone when, you know, when you're measuring two incompatible observables. So this is very interesting. I've suppressed the essence of quantum mechanics. There's no collapse of the wave function. In fact, this diffusion can be described by the fokker planck equation. It's very classical. So now I have a new tool. I can actually change the measurement axis. I can suppress this. Can I now use this for a measurement task? And that's the final piece of the talk. But just to show you a few interesting things. If you have these two axes line up with zero degrees, you see the steady state population shown as the cross section of this block sphere are the two poles. That's where you would have expected the two eigenstates. As you vary the angle, let's say to 18 degrees, then you have this little cap, and this cap gets bigger and bigger, and at 90 degrees, in fact, it's just diffusing around the outer rim. There is no eigenstate anymore. All of it is equally likely. So what about this McCone and Patty relation that I started off with? You can calculate the norm of the change of the density matrix. This is how much the quantum state is changing. It's like a force. When this delta rho is zero, then the state is not going to move, right? The density matrix is not changing. And that's shown as a color plot here. This black is zero, and then finite values here. So you see, when you are measuring with the two axes aligned, right, the two angles are, are zero, then there are two points 
where this force is zero. And those are the eigenstates, and that's how quantum mechanics works. And it's very interesting to look at this plot. You always have a force which drives you to the eigenstates. And in this case, the force goes away when you're measuring non-commuting observables. So with this capability, you can collapse a quantum state to anything you want. And that's actually a resource in quantum computing. I can produce states of the desired character. OK. In the final piece, can we actually make a measurement that we were unable to do before in the classical domain? OK. Keeping the same theme of photons and atoms and cavities, I have basically a, a state of a photon, coherent state. So it's a wave. Right? A wave has an amplitude and a phase. And I can represent the amplitude of the coherent state or of the wave as the length of a vector, right? And if you want, that's really square root of n bar, the number of photons in this coherent state. And it has a phase, right? After all, it's a wave. And the question is, what things of this vector can I measure? I can measure its length. That's measured with a photodetector, or in this case, a photomultiplier tube. That measures the operator A dagger A in your Hamiltonian. I can measure the projections on these two axes, which are called in-phase and quadrature phase. So this is measuring x and this is measuring p. Okay? But there's a big elephant in the room. What is the one thing that I have not measured directly? The phase. I have no device to measure phase. And the question is, can I build a device to truly measure the quantum mechanical phase of a system? So this phase, you would define something like this, as a sum of all the number states that are there. After all, if you have a state that's perfectly well known in number, its phase, of course, must be unknown. And if you know it in phase, then the number of particles must also be a superposition. So for the purest quantum mechanics people, defining a phase operator is actually very hard, because you have to get the gauge degrees of freedom right, and so on and so forth. But I will feign my experimental hat for this one and say what I really simply want is some device where the probability of a certain phase corresponds to the state that I produce. So it's something that operationally measures phase. How do I do this? Every time I make a measurement of that vector, I'm going to kick it around. You see, that's the quantum mechanical problem. I try to measure it, and I kick it. So I always lose accuracy. So here's the experiment to be done. I showed you the very first thing, the spontaneous emissions problem. I'm going to realize that now in the laboratory. So I take my qubit, my Josephson junction circuit, and I put it again in this beautiful superposition state, and it goes around. Right? It, its phase is going to evolve until it emits a photon. And I don't know when that happens. <clears throat> that means I don't know the, the, wave, uh, the phase of the wave packet coming out. Right? Going, going around, some random time it leaves. So the output state is the ground state plus some unknown phase times the one state when it emits. And this state you can write as the vacuum state plus this phase times a dagger acting on the vacuum. That's one excitation of the system. Now I have to go measure it. Right? I have now a, an amplifier, and I can choose the direction of the vector to measure. Okay? Why does that matter? It matters because, you see, if I want to measure the number, I should measure the length of the vector. If I want to measure the phase, I should measure perpendicular to that. And those are the two quadratures to measure. And the problem in quantum mechanics <clears throat> is that as, as soon as I make a measurement, there's jitter. This arrow goes up and down. So this procedure of canonical phase measurement is the following. I make a weak measurement first of this system. And I make a guess, where is this vector? That's what we were doing with the trajectories, right? We made a guess. After I make a guess, <clears throat> I measure 90 degrees to it. And I keep changing it with each weak measurement. I keep changing my measurement axis. So you can see, after many measurements, I will be measuring exactly orthogonal to that. And it turns out, <clears throat> this qubit emits a photon at an unknown time, thus unknown phase. We estimate the state with a weak measurement. We adjust the protocol in real time, and what's amazing is that this adaptive protocol can reach unit efficiency. This was the paper of Howard Weisman to show this. And the best you can do in classical physics is that if you fix your measurement axis, 
that's a homodyne measurement, you can get 80% at best. Okay? Because you don't know where the arrow points. You take your guess. If you make a heterodyne measurement, that means you're rotating and sampling all of those phases. So you do a little bit better, 89%. So the real question was, could we beat 89% using a quantum protocol? We did. So you go ahead and start to measure the output vector, and it looks just like the photon which is emitted. Right? There's the length of the vector r, and I want to measure its angle and its length. This is a measurement of phase, basically the argument of this vector. And the variance here is shown as this is the quantum limit of unity in these units. And you can see with this adaptive protocol you are here, with heterodyne you are here. Okay. There's this marked difference between those two. So then you can ask the cynical physicist question, is that experimental noise or did you really beat the heterodyne limit? So we did something very simple. We had this protocol where you fed back the information. We just stopped feeding back the information. We kept collecting it and we call this replay, you measure exactly the heterodyne result. So we just turned off the feedback. So you can see unambiguously that quantum mechanics allows you to do that. And to wrap up the talk, what I want to show you is that what happens when you're measuring the length, when you're measuring the phase, what happens to the length? Actually, you get very little information about the length. So the variance goes down. You are not actually perturbing that degree of freedom. So in the final slide, let me show you here. These are now the trajectories when I'm changing my measurement axis in real time. And that red bar shows you where the measurement axis is. This is before the atom decays. This is during its coherent evolution. And so what I want to end with, it's a very strange trajectory, right? It's going all over the place. What I want to end with is this very unique feature of quantum mechanics. I told you in the beginning, this measurement looks like a bad thing. But actually, it's a really useful thing. Because not only have I improved the efficiency of this photon coming out, I can ask the atom, which property did I measure of yours? That's very strange. Did I measure your phase or did I measure your length, your photon number? Because if I look at the trajectories and I look at the variance, what happens here is that when I'm making a heterodyne measurement, this is a measurement of length, you see there's equal fuzz. It doesn't change with time. In the adaptive measurement, as I start to measure more and more phase, I don't have uncertainty anymore in position because I'm not measuring it. So the atom is telling me that I'm actually measuring phase and it's changing with time. So you see, there's a unique signature on the atom that tells me what I measured. So even if you didn't believe necessarily the accuracy coming out, the atom told, tells you that you measured my phase. So this is a very unique feature of, of quantum mechanics. So to finish, again, this idea that I think quantum technology is also driving new ideas in quantum foundations. Right? And this cycle is going back and forth. Where now we realize that our observations of the world around us reflect some aspects of a much more complex reality. We need this understanding to explain the world around us as our tools get better. And we're finally entering an era where the quantum nature of matter is an engineering resource. Okay. And if I were to sort of share with you my view of some of the highlights of the last 40 years, in the 80s it wasn't obvious that Joseph's injunctions obey circuits, obey quantum mechanics like atoms. Now we believe this. And then how to decouple them from the environment, so you can see it. How to control these qubits and then trajectories, and then how to do these trajectories in many qubits. So I think the quantum computer, aside from solving all the world's problems, aside from politics, may be actually the ultimate test of quantum mechanics. Okay. And we have now penned a lot of these ideas in a book which will finally come out, uh, in Cambridge University Press, on these new notions of measurement. And I think this is really the question that I'd like to keep in my mind. Is there a limit to how many particles that we can entangle and control? Can we test quantum mechanics in a regime where it was not intended perhaps to function and see what happens there? So with that, let me stop and take your questions. Thank you. We have open for questions. for your nice uh, presentation. My question is about the uh, first part, mm -hmm. where you showed the uh, quantum trajectory of yes. the sphere. If you can go to this slide, please. I will try. So
So the question is, you, you kick that spin rapidly, uh -huh. many times. Uh -huh. And you can kick it slightly up, slightly down. But in the end, you always end up in the same uh, final state. Why is that? Uh, no, so that's one trajectory. So when you take a family of them, you will get the statistics of the state. Half of them up and half of them down here. So, so you, you are showing just one trajectory. I showed one, single trajectory. <clears throat> and in fact, we can do lots of things. We can measure their statistics, how many go up and how many go down. We can put a Rabi oscillation and see how many of them track. We can actually find the most likely path in Hilbert space. If there are some defects, how it goes around in Hilbert space. So all of these things we can do. I wanted to illustrate that accessing one trajectory is, is a resource. But we can prove all the canonical quantum mechanics. Nothing is wrong with the theory. Joel Miller, University of Utah. I'm going to ask you your question. Is there a limit to how many particles, say humans, that we can fully entangle and control? Well, I don't know the answer to your question, which is the question I'm asking, Joel. It sounds like the mechanics that is best. But um, I have the sociological feeling within me that's driving me, saying that every hundred years we change our theories of physics in response to better tools. This has been always the case, that's there. So we're looking a little bit deeper, I'm peeling the onion a little bit deeper. So is, is there something else there? I think so. What it is, I don't know. But it's worth looking. Any other questions? Thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, in, in, all your, uh, in all the slides, I think you show the density matrix to stay in a, in a pure state. Mm -hmm. So it's a consequence because you, you include decoherence in the system, right? So in the, in the real system, there's all the decoherence. So should one consider the density, density of this operator, the length of the air effect is not unity anymore? No, that's a great question. So we are in the limit where we are the dominant source of decoherence. So basically, in fact, there is no amplitude damping that's there. So those pure states are staying pure, but the formalism applies, and in fact, with the measurement of multiple observables, I can actually purify the state. So I can start right in the center of the density matrix and push it out to the sphere. So we can see all of those effects that are there. For simplicity, I just showed you the evolution of pure states. Thank you. One more, I think. Next. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Um, if I understood correctly, so you take roughly on the microsecond time scale to collapse to protect the, the, the state, right? My question is, I mean, is it natural? I mean, what defines essentially this time scale? I mean, is it due to the system? Can you manipulate it? Can you control it? How do you expect it? It's a great question of time scales and what sets them. So, in nature, sets the time scale, meaning the defects. So the qubits that I have, have a spontaneous emission lifetime of a few hundred microseconds. So I kind of have to do all the action in less than that. What's the shortest time that I can measure uh, to get one data point is about 16 nanoseconds. That's how fast I can measure. So if I take those 16 nanoseconds and string together a trajectory, then it's a few hundred of nanoseconds, maybe a microsecond. And that, to answer his question, is still one one hundredth of the decoherence from the environment happens at an exponential level. So that sets the time scale. There is nothing magical. There's always ratios of the defacing time from the environment to the defacing time of your measurement. And you always want to be in this limit where the measurement induced defacing by you is dominant. Otherwise, you will be losing information to your brother who doesn't talk to you, right? which is the environment. You want to be the one that gets all the information. More questions? See that? coming. Time scale. <laughs> Thank you very much for the beautiful uh, overview where we are. And definitely we are seeing a serious um, development in getting us uh, the, the quantum computer, what you have highlighted. And uh, my question is, is, now we are getting better understanding and quantifying uh, the qubit and the quantum 
uh, fidelity, we have the challenge of scaling up the large number of qubits. If the measurements we have now is adapted, uh, adaptable to large number of qubits, and uh, how this target of 2030 getting 100,000 qubit plus can be realized? In Oxfordshire, you will have it soon. <laughs> so the question is a good one. Do we have, in fact, if I were to rephrase the question, do we know enough to actually build a quantum computer? Are all the pieces there and it's just an engineering challenge? So, of course, this is a, a debatable political question that's there. So I will give you only my humble opinion. I think not at all. Okay. Because if you are thinking about the evolution of... So if you think about the evolution of classical computing technologies, we went from Abacus in you know year 100 to other slide rule, to uh, vacuum tube, to bipolar transistor, to you know things that were more integrated circuit, etc. We are we along this development, I would say vacuum tube at best, right? Because with the 100 vacuum tubes, by the time you wire up tube number 100, tube number one is blown out. This is basically what's happening with your quantum volume. You put 500 qubits, you try to entangle all of them, the first parts don't work. So in my mind, I think we need something transformative and disruptive to think about more robust ways to save this information, more robust ways to measure this information, and things where error correction is perhaps a bit more tenable than the number that we're looking at currently. So that's my academic national lab kind of hat on, saying that I think there's still a lot of work to be done in thinking about the fundamental systems in which we encode this quantum information and manipulating. So there's a lot of space for everyone in the room. Okay, do you have any questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker.